You know, I've had a lot of people complaining that I spend too much time talking about comics when I should be focused on video games. Well, I got some bad news for you guys specifically. Yeah. Because now I'm also a cooking channel. Welcome to Nick Snacks. And today I'm going to show you how to put together a quick and easy breakfast without any need of using an oven. Because last time that happened... Butterfingers. But that's okay. When do you actually have time to have a big hearty breakfast anyway? If you're anything like me, no matter when you're starting your day, you're probably already running late for it. Thankfully, I was taught in an early age of the shortcut known as cereal. Problem is, most of it's gonna kill you. But that is where Magic Spoon comes in. Each box packs 13 to 14 grams of protein and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. And only 140 calories per serving. It has zero grams of sugar. It's keto friendly, gluten free, grain free, soy free. Regardless of your dietary restrictions, you can still enjoy a bowl of cereal. Wow. No fire! For real, for any peanut butter lovers out there, you need to try the peanut butter flavor. It is fantastic. They've got a ton of flavors outside of your fruity and your peanut butter and your cocoa. You also have maple waffle, you got blueberry, you've got cookies and cream, cinnamon, it's a whole bunch of stuff. And if you don't like this for any reason, you get your money back, no questions asked. And they're also shipping to the UK and Canada, so what are you waiting for? And come on, Sonic fans, I've seen you guys talk about cereal on Twitter. I know you're excited about stuff like this. Now, if all that sounds good to you, you can put together your own variety box over on their website and use the offer code APOLOGIST to get $5 off your order, or just go to banjixmoo.com slash APOLOGIST. Either way works fine. Wow, cooking's sure easy when you don't have to do it. Thank you to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video, and uh, let's get on with it. Welcome back to Sonic Speed Reading. With the craziness of the metal virus, the world needed to rebuild. They didn't talk a whole lot about it during the Chow Race, and that's partially because we were dealing with a different location that wasn't too largely affected by everything that happened. But now we have Sonic and Tails guiding Belle, who still doesn't have a home since they found her, to Restoration HQ, and they do walk through some ruins to remind you that, yes, everything with Sonic Forces has happened, everything with the metal virus has happened, and there is still damage to undo. Belle does take note of this, saying she's not sure if this is the right place because everything does look like it's wrecked. But as you can see from Sonic and Tails, they're not too worried about it and they keep on walking. And they find themselves in a janky little tool shed. You might remember this from the first annual where Silver and Blaze planted a garden. So that's a fun little callback. Belle is looking a little concerned and who can blame her? She does have a couple of teenage boys with knowing smirks on their faces guiding her to an abandoned part of town in a janky tool shed. But not to worry, Tails jiggles a shovel and the floor begins to shake, revealing itself to be an elevator. Yeah, as it turns out, the Restoration HQ now has a secret entrance. The Restoration decided to keep the town ruins as is as a memorial for everybody they lost during the war and metal virus or whatever else they've been through a lot. But hey, it can also double as something of camouflage as well. Anyway, the elevator stops, the doors open, and reveals to us an underground mall slash subway station? I don't know. I really like the design though. This is Restoration's new HQ and it looks modern and fun and I think that's Gadget from the Rescue Rangers there. We may not have Not Whole or the Freedom Fighters anymore, but they are still relying on a lot of those ideas established early on in American Sonic canon. But yeah, as you can see, this is a big giant area, so it might not be easy to find somebody specific unless that person is completely obsessed with you. <laughs> Yeah, so Sonic is wondering where Amy is, only to have her pop up right in front of him <laughs> with sparkling eyes saying, Hi! Yeah, I know she's had to evolve and grow as a character over the years, but I still love seeing these little quirks and this relation between these characters that was established so long ago. I'll talk about Amy a separate time. I love her character and I love her relationship to Sonic, however it's depicted. Okay, so they weren't actually here to see Amy, but rather that giant bug behind behind her, Jewel the Beetle. That just reminds me, I should have named my shower beetle Jewel. If you don't listen to Sunset City, you probably should. That was a 
gross story. Just to remind you, at the end of the Metal Virus, Amy was quite overwhelmed with all the duties that came with being in charge of the restoration, so she handed that position off to Jewel, seeing as she's a far more organized person. Problem is, she doesn't have a whole lot of self-confidence, but we will deal with that in the next story arc. Regardless of anything else, she is still a warm, friendly person, and she openly welcomes Belle, saying that there is always room for volunteers. But of course, everybody in the restoration pitches in while they're here. So of course, Jewel asks Belle what kind of skills she has, to which Belle says, uh, mostly woodworking. Jewel says they don't do a lot of that. I do think it's a little weird that something that literally calls itself the restoration doesn't have a great need for woodworking. Yes, I know that's old school compared to a lot of other dwellings we have these days, but that is still a very essential skill for a lot of... Whatever, doesn't matter. Jewel thinks Belle might be of some use over at the machine shop. So she asks this lamb girl if she can guide Belle over to said machine shop. I gotta say, after growing up with the Archie series and the old Sad AM stuff and everything we got over here in America, I love seeing all these species actually properly sonic-fied. Look, I love my freedom fighters, do not get me wrong, but they did not really fit in with a lot of the game design, so this always makes me happy. I know I've said it before, I'm bound to say it again. And something else I've mentioned before, we have seen this lamb girl. She does have a great design, I do love it, but we always see her with some sort of resentment in her face, so she's probably gonna be a problem down the road. Somebody on Twitter mentioned her by name. I don't remember it off the top of my head, and I think that's partially the point. Like, it's a memorable enough design, but since she doesn't get a lot of screen time prior to this point, I do think they've been planting her here for something bigger. While that is going on, Jewel and Amy show Sonic and Tails around the rest of Restoration HQ, as they've definitely spruced things up from their last location. I have told you guys before that some of these story arcs are a little bit slower than what you might be used to, but again, I do appreciate that they do at least mention that not everything is breaking up robots and going on grand adventures. A lot of this volunteer work and restoring the world does require a lot of office work as well, and that's why Jewel is up to the task. But yeah, while Sonic and Tails are hanging out in the computer room, we go back over to Belle and the lamb lady here. Belle, unfortunately, is still feeling a bit out of place as she does get some side eyes from some passing civilians, and we find ourselves over at the machine shop, which, yeah, is an underground subway tunnel, isn't it? I guess this whole area is a train station. That's awesome. Just give me Ninja Turtle 2 vibes. I'm all, <laughs> I'm all about it. Look, I don't know what to tell you. I know they're not the only ones that have anything to do with subways, but the Ninja Turtles have given me a deep appreciation for underground architecture in the New York City area. <laughs> anyway, we are introduced to this orangutan hippie guy who is in charge of the machine shop. And yes, you can tell from his demeanor and that tie-dye shirt that he's a very chill dude, as when he's addressed as sir, he says to chill out on the official type stuff. Gotta relax, sister. And yeah, he does react to Belle like Tails did, kinda. Says that she's got a far out look and asks her what her make is. <laughs> They actually didn't give us a name here for this guy. Wonder if we'll get it later. But yeah, he asks Belle to hand a wrench so he can get to work on a sedan as we see the lamb lady walk out of frame with half her face covered in thick black shadow. I wonder if they're implying that she's gonna be a problem later. Something I was wondering when I started this issue was why Belle was here at all. Because if you remember just one issue prior, Tails had invited her over to his workshop. And I assumed that she was just gonna be living there. She could read Eggman Codex, she was helping out with schematics that indicated to me that she would be a crucial part of whatever plans the heroes had to make when having to take down Eggman. She proved essential in rebuilding Omega after all. But as we see from this montage, she just might have been getting more in the way than anything else. She gets herself caught on fire. She accidentally hurts the orangutan. She doesn't know how to make coffee. <laughs> She's trying to be helpful, but she is more of a klutz than we initially realized. And if you remember, she does have that unintentional reaction whenever her tail is pulled, which does happen in one comedic event after another, leads her to almost dropping a boat. But it is saved at the last second, thanks to the arrival of Tangle. And what was two pages ago, this super chilled, laid back, hippie orangutan is now pissed as hell. <laughs> He sees Belle as a liability, and he cannot have her in his shop. But Tangle, again, is at the rescue, as she says she'll take it from here. <laughs> I love that the orangutan says for both of them to get out of there, because Tangle is not allowed in there. <laughs> 
We know enough about Tangle's personality up to this point in the comic. We don't need to see whatever this ball bearing incident was. It's much funnier knowing that at some point off screen, she was enough of a problem in the machine shop that she was banned. I love it. And she is also the most perfect person for Belle to run into at this point. Because we also know that Tangle is one of the most outgoing, caring people in this new cast of characters. She's as extrovert as they come and in the best way. I mean, she's super tight with Whisper of all people. And she's just the person a self-doubting little robot with no place in the world needs right now. Because where Belle sees her tail as a liability, because anytime it's pulled, it goes off into a kicking frenzy, Tangle sees a sister in Tails as she, well, does everything with her tail. So she thinks Belle is nothing short of awesome. It literally ties them together. <laughs> I love these expressions. They're so good. I just love that about her personality. Everything that Belle sees about herself as an accident waiting to happen or an uncontrollable mistake, Tangle sees nothing but potential. She thinks it's awesome. She wonders what kind of crazy crap they can get up to with their two tails and just flat out says, let's be friends. So yes, they introduce themselves and they're immediately friends. Because again, this is Tangle. If she decides you're her friend, you're her friend. And they're just tight now. And she just walks with Belle like they've known each other for years. It's, ah, oh, she's fantastic. I don't think enough people talk about how great her character is in that aspect. But unfortunately, we also know that Tangle is something of an adrenaline junkie. Because now that the friendship stuff is settled, she needs something exciting to happen so she can see what kind of crazy crap they can get up to with their stupid ass abilities. <laughs> and they overhear a couple of women talking about a freak storm along the coast, saying that it's in no way natural, and they wonder if Eggman's up to something again. This stresses Belle out, but this leaves <laughs> <laughs> this leaves Tangle shivering with excitement. Oh my god, that expression. She literally picks up Belle and rushes on over to Jewel so she can take charge of the mission, but unfortunately, Sonic, Tails, and Amy are already surrounding the screen talking about the weather. They're looking over a picture taken by a scouting drone before it was taken out by a storm surge, and it looks like, well, a giant tower that looks like a checkpoint from the games, is emitting a lot of energy which is causing the surrounding area to react with a lot of storms, which could be a problem for surrounding coastal villages. And of course, Sonic responds that, hey, if it's something Eggman related, him and Tails can handle it. And Amy, clearly starving for an adventure with Sonic, says that she's going to join in as well. Tangle cheers, saying it's mission time, but unfortunately, Belle interrupts her, saying that she's on inventory duty this week. They've got donations to catalog, which immediately pumps out. Poor Tangle. Belle reminds her that everybody in the restoration has to do their part. <laughs> that song's like, don't worry. If Eggy summons a god of destruction or digs up some ancient fighting robots, we'll let you know. All while this is happening, Belle is thinking to herself that he might be there. But if she says that she wants to go, they'll want to know why, and she can't risk that. So she instead turns to the ever eager Tangle and says that she has an idea. The story then shifts our focus over to Sonic, Tails, and Amy arriving at said tower. The trio make quick work of the egg ponds out front and slam through the front door. But in their momentum, they launch themselves straight into a portal. Rut row. We turn our attention back to Belle and Tangle as Belle begins to work on restoring a hover bike. Tangle is excited for a new adventure, but she begins to explain that she is second guessing this idea. She did join the restoration to help support Jewel since she took over but she hardly sees her friend. And maybe this is a bad idea. Maybe they shouldn't go against Jules' wishes. But before she can do anything else about it, the hover bike is back up and running. And this design, it's too polygonal not to come from a video game. I can't recall what game that might be from. Maybe it's a bad Nick ride. Maybe it's from Sonic Shuffle. Maybe it's an arcade cab. Sega had some wild ones. I don't know. If you do, let me know. But yeah, the girls are off to the tower themselves as we once again shift our focus back to Sonic, Tails, and Amy. As they arrive on the other side of this, well, teleporter door, whatever that was. It shuts itself off, therefore shutting them off from an exit as they find themselves peering down a long hallway. This could be a trap, this could be dangerous, but Sonic's never been one to shy away from a new adventure. So he immediately speeds down the hallway, finds himself an egg pond, and immediately wrecks it, saying that if there are bots close by, there's got to be something worth finding. And yes, that's true. Those are basic video game rules. Tails is wondering what it was doing with a piece of chalk. And yeah, I just realized that too. It is just walking down the hallway, drawing a line. <laughs> 
What? Amy says they're not too worried about it. They'll figure it out. They always do. But next panel shows us 10 minutes later. That's impossible. They'll never find the ending to this place. And I love specifically that it's 10 minutes, which is the exact amount of time you are allotted in the classic game acts before you find yourself with a timeout and a lost life. This tells me, at least in the IDW universe, that these characters can only stand for 10 minutes worth of exploring before they just completely give up on life. Thankfully, they have a genius in tow, and Tails puts an arrow on the wall. He wants to test something out. He begins running down the hallway, drawing even more arrows, eventually coming back around to the spot where he drew that initial arrow. But this time, it's not there. Tails concludes that somehow this place is changing around them as they move through it. And he wonders what the heck they're going to do about it, and Sonic sees it as nothing but a challenge, saying that if this thing wants to shift around him, then it better keep up with him. So he grabs a hold of his friends and begins to launch off, which seems to send them <laughs> through a prism of colors, possibly multiple dimensions, maybe mirrors, who can say, but something crazy is going down. Got some mirror universe shenanigans going on here. They're finding it very disorienting, not sure which way is up, so it's Amy's turn to try something out. As she swings her Pico hammer into a wall, which <laughs> seems to completely break time and space. Who can say? Something crazy trippy is going on here, and they're caught in a Technicolor nightmare. <sighs> Gosh, I wish you were a hypersonic reference. So yeah, that's where the first part of this story ends, and it picks back up with them lost in a trippy void of space filled with geometric shapes, and yeah, actually looking a lot like the Sonic Advance special stage, isn't it? So yeah, again, I think IDW is help canonizing in their own universe a lot of other game stuff we would see, which again, I've stated before, I absolutely adore when they try to explain things that were created for game mechanics. Tails hypothesizes that Eggman has created a space where he can somehow circumvent normal spatial laws, thus allowing him to construct an autonomously tessellating proportionally expansive structure without concern over typical physical limitations. The hedgehogs, and I'm sure some of the audience looks a little confused, but all that basically means is that Eggman has somehow created a pocket dimension where he can goof around with the laws of physics, and since he can fly, he can navigate this area a little bit better than the hedgehogs, so he grabs a hold of both of them and begins to guide them through the crazy crashing geometry shapes. Sonic wonders if it's some sort of a trap, and I mean, that very well could be, but Tails says considering how easily they broke out of it, he's not sure. Eggman knows what they can do, and if he meant to trap them, he should have compensated for that. Tails looks around, assuming that this place is nowhere near as big as it actually looks, and he finds an exit. So, they head towards it. And what they find on the other side is, um, well, a quaint village. They are back on solid ground, but something is giving them very eerie vibes. While all this craziness is happening, we cut back over to Tangle and Bell as they finally arrive to the troublesome Storm Tower. They land, finding themselves among a bunch of busted egg ponds, assuming that Sonic and Pals have already been here, which is no problem for Tangle. That just means that they can catch up with their friends that much faster. And as they walk through one of the rooms, Bell catches a glimpse of a giant Eggman logo. Golly, I wonder why that would catch her eye. Tangle snaps Belle out of her distraction and leads her over to a vent, which leads them into the door room from Monsters Incorporated. It's actually a room full of badniks that looks like they're building something, and it's full of those teleporter doors that Sonic, Tails, and Amy had first flown through. The girls sneak around as we overhear a couple of robotic voices. One asks the other if the pawn squad had fixed out a hole, but unfortunately it looks like they all got lost. To which the other laments that this was such a nice, quiet job until Sonic showed up, wondering how he even found out about the base. The other voice responds saying that, well, at least they're still trapped in chamber one, but the first voice says that they got into chamber two. And we soon discover what you probably already figured out, that the two robot voices are Orbot and Cubot. Unfortunately, Sonic is making such a mess that they have to do something that they never want to do, and that is call their boss. Eggman picks up saying he's busy, so they better make it quick. How have they screwed up now? Nervously, they tell their boss that Sonic and his pals have gotten into the test chambers, and they flinch, ready to be yelled at, but Eggman instead says that while Sonic's arrival is unexpected, it's not entirely unwelcome. He says that he'll take it from here, as we shift our focus back to the girls who overheard the entire conversation, Belle looking down at Tangle, saying that that was Dr. Eggman, like she's coming to a realization of sorts. She didn't expect him to sound so, but before she can even finish the sentence, she slips and falls into the path of three marching egg pawns. But to her surprise, they walk right by her without even taking notice. Tangle yanks 
her back up, asking her what that was all about. Belle says she has no idea, but Tangle wraps her up in her tail, saying that she wants the truth now. Why was she so hell-bent on coming here? And Belle confesses that she just had to be sure of something. That little incident just proves it, that whatever she was built with, it's the same as them. She is a badnik, but she doesn't want to hurt anybody. She just wants answers, and she felt that the only person who would have those answers would be Dr. Eggman. But as we saw as she overheard his voice and saw that logo, she might have a feeling for something that we probably already figured out. Belle says that if Tangle wants to smash her Calm down, shippers. or leave her, she will understand. Damn. But Tangle says that Sonic and Tails vouch for you, so you're alright in my books. And she's far from the first robot friend made by Eggman that they deeply trust, so no big deal. All that matters to Tangle is that she is trying to do the right thing. It does not matter where she came from. So, she drops the interrogation and they get back to it. But this time, Tangle promises that she will help Belle find the answers she is looking for. We turn our attention back to Sonic, Tails, and Amy as they walk through the empty streets of this creepy villa. Sonic says he'll do a quick sweep of the area, but Tails reminds him that this place is probably using the same spatial warping as the other maze. And, uh, yeah, it is. Meanwhile, Amy is trying something I still to this day try in every open world game I come across, and that is check for an open door and she happens to find one it opens to an impeccable interior which uh yeah also gives off a bit of a creepy dollhouse vibe doesn't it sonic calls out for anybody they don't get a response but amy looks into a room and sees that somebody is in there she apologizes for barging in but before she can finish her question she sees that the person is in fact a test dummy which yeah just makes things even creepier <laughs> they're not doing anything so they just leave the doll B and head upstairs where they hear a lot of scraping and clicking in the bathroom. They look into the bath to find themselves. <laughs> <laughs> the creepiest caterpillar I have ever seen. It's amazing what a surreal yet mundane setting and a set of mandibles can do for a design. That is awesome. As you'd expected, a quick fight breaks out. Amy smashes the caterpillar with her hammer and they head on downstairs to where they find themselves, well, basically in that scene in Sid's bedroom from Toy Story with a lot of mangled, messed up looking badniks. Looks like Eggman's been having too much fun with one of those online Pokemon fusion generators as he's done that with his own creations. But while they are a little bit creepier, that doesn't make them any less smashable. Sonic wrecks the ones inside the house and tells the others to block the windows so others can't get in. And as we look out the window, it seems there are quite a few of them. It's too many for them to take on directly, so they gotta figure out a plan. Tails says that if they can track the wireless comm signal of the badniks back to their source, that might lead them to an exit. It's a start, but Amy's still not sure why any of this is happening, and Sonic agrees. He thought this would be some kind of a trap, but Eggman loves to rub his face in it if he thinks he's got Sonic trapped, but they have not seen any sign of him yet. Tails agrees, this feels impersonal. I also have to agree, and it does make it that much creepier, and I like it for that reason. And all this mystery puts Sonic's quills on edge. Be careful with those quills, Sonic. Fans get upset if you mess with them too much. But as he says all this, the iconic laughter comes out from... A toaster. <laughs> yeah, so Eggman is communicating with them through a toaster that has his own label on it. <laughs> I love that this lunatic has all these crazy deadly robots and they all still look like toys, but he'll also make theme parks and I guess go so far as to make modern homes and appliances and still slap his label on it. Fantastic. And apparently he's put speakers in all of them. He's got a stand mixer talking crap to Sonic. We got Sonic looking down at the toaster. <laughs> As it explains to him, as well as the oven and the fridge, that this isn't a trap. This place is a test. Not for Sonic, though, but instead Eggman's most cutting-edge technological concepts. He explains it as a crucible for what could become the next generation of mechanical monstrosities let loose upon your unsuspecting planet, which, again, doesn't currently have a name. Debate Earth, debate Mobius, I don't care. They're not telling you, and that's a problem for me. But yes, this is why Eggman man isn't upset that Sonic managed to find himself here because now he's got a set of real test dummies to set these crazy badniks upon. That is where part two ends. Part three picks up with Bell and Tangle still in hiding while Orbot and Cubot continue to run the machines that seem to be creating these fused badniks. And I love that they're... <laughs> 
<laughs> they come out of a slot machine. That's a fun callback to not only Sonic games in general, as they're chock full of slot machines, but also Sonic X, as they use something akin to this when they were doing their Robot of the Week setup in that first season. I love this. That's awesome. I also love how much fun the art seems to be here. Like, Evan seems to be having a great time combining all these classic badniks together. This whole thing's a lot of fun. I just love how they're playing around with these iconic designs from the games. <laughs> I love this motobug and masher, well, mashup. <laughs> Got some hardcore Magikarp vibes from that. That's awesome. Magikarp? We'll call it Magikarp. Yeah. Maybe it'll hit hard if it flails extra hard. That's clearly a Magikarp joke. I just, whatever. I love this. But yeah, by this point, Bell and Tangle have figured out what's going on here. Orbot and Cubot are sending out these bad nicks to go mess with Sonic. So Tangle interrupts the operation by, well, tangling up the two robots. But while that's going on, we cut back to Sonic and his pals that are still trapped inside of this empty building. Well, I say empty, but they still have those test dummies. But not only that, Eggy still has a bit of control over the house itself as one of the test dummies is caught on fire and in turn the rest of the house begins to catch in flames. I just need to say it while I'm here because I tweeted about this, I noticed this when this issue first came out, and I know I wasn't the only one, but this would have been a great place to introduce the Tails doll if they were allowed to or if they ever were. We still don't know on an official level if he's considered part of classic game canon only or if they're allowed to use him in the modern designs. This comes close to it, and we at least have a reason why Eggman would create something like the Tails doll. But yeah, back to the story. Sonic, Tails, and Amy bust out through the wall and get back onto the street. It looks like Tails has figured out the source of all the bad Nick signals, so they begin to head on out, but unfortunately, also something from the games, if you're familiar with Crazy Gadget or the Death Egg Zone from Sonic and Knuckles, the gravity flips on them as the ground is now in the sky. He grabs a hold of Amy and ricochets off of the bad Nicks to keep himself airborne while Tails, being Tails, flies alongside him. He grabs a hold of a chimney so they don't fall into the endless, seemingly endless abyss of the sky below or whatever's going on in this test chamber as they have to cook up a new plan. Unfortunately, Tails has lost track of any sort of signal he had before. And now it's Sonic's turn to test their most dangerous hypothesis yet. He recalls that while he was talking shit to a toaster, that Eggman wanted to show them something and he couldn't very well do that if they were dead. So they decide to just let go and fall into the void. And sure enough, in the darkness, they come across a Tesseract. Yeah, that word existed before the Avengers, I promise. To give you the most simplified definition of what that means, it basically is used to represent fourth dimensional space. And I think it's being used here to kind of represent that this is going beyond what we comprehend in our physical reality, meaning that Aggie's got full control and rules are out the window. But mind bendy reality has never been much to stop Sonic. Sonic, so they hop on in and he calls out Eggman. Walls form around them and the ever iconic Egg Viper from Sonic Adventure shows up. And Sonic says, hey, I've dealt with this kind of bot before. No big deal. And I love that it's specifically Sonic that says he's dealt with it because yeah, Amy and Tails were playable in Sonic Adventure, but this was never a boss fight for them. But even though they've never dealt with one before, they figure out the rules pretty quickly as they begin to knock the crap out of it. And yet they even do the hop, skip, and the jump that you have to do as Sonic. That's awesome. But unfortunately, unlike the normal boss from Sonic Adventure, this time Sonic gets zapped. But also unlike the boss fight from the game, Sonic has his friends around. So Tails helps give Sonic some air so he can take a crack at the cockpit. But where Sonic is expecting Eggman to crawl out, he's instead met with a hologram and an exploding cockpit, which sends Sonic flying. Eggman says that that's one point for Sonic, so let's see how they do in round two. Because yeah, now we get three A Egg Vipers. And it looks like they're all being controlled by Eggman with the VR unit. <laughs> And that's not just any VR unit. That is a Sega VR unit. This was never officially released, but yeah, back in the Genesis days, Sega was working on a proper VR unit. That is an awesome deep cut and something I would expect from IDW. That is amazing. They might also be referencing Sega ages with that final line with Eggman saying he hasn't had this much fun in ages. I mean, that wouldn't exactly be a stretch. He is wearing a canceled VR Sega unit on his head after all. But yeah, these Vipers are giving our heroes hell, each of them with their own corresponding powers. Red one being fire, blue one water, and the green one wind. We cut back to Belle and Tangle as she somewhat attempts to interrogate the two bots, and they all end up looking like idiots, but... <laughs> 
that's all well and fine as Belle is currently working on something on this little tablet here, redirecting egg pawns so they don't bother them, and discovering a live feed of Sonic and everything going on with the egg pawns. All well and dandy, but the most important thing Belle has discovered is that she can potentially track down which portal leads to Sonic and in turn rescue them, but that might take a while. But Tangle accelerates the process by tricking Orbot and Cubot into showing her which one they're actually in. Tangle wraps her tail around a pipe to hold as an anchor while she is going to jump in. Belle reprimands her, saying that it's reckless. They have no idea if Tangle will end up in the middle of the ocean or get her molecule scambled or any number of things. And Tangle just says, well, you saw how the fight was going on the live feed. There's no time for second guessing. Whatever happens, happens. Trusting your gut and accepting the consequences is just what heroes do. Sounds a bit irresponsible, but well, really no time for that particular conversation. As part three ends with Tangle taking a leap of faith. Part four begins with Sonic and his pals not doing super great against these new egg vipers. But Sonic, seeing his friends in danger, hatches a plan on the fly. As the fire viper wraps itself around Tails and Amy, he tricks the water viper into spraying its brother down, just as the wind viper comes in to clear out the smoke. Sonic then has Amy use her Pico Hammer to launch him up to the air viper, which blasts a gust into a spin ball, which sends it flying straight into the water viper. That is one down, but unfortunately, the wind viper is back for revenge and pins all three down with a pair of cyclones. Just as Tangle arrives through the teleporter from above, landing smack dab on top of said viper. As all that's happening, the comic turns its attention back to Belle, as well as Orbot and Cubot, which are still wrapped up in Tangle's tail. Enemies they may be, the two lackey bots remain as polite as ever, as Orbot asks for Belle's attention. He's got a question, but before he can ask it, Belle answers for him, tired of a question she's been asked quite a few times up to this point, saying that she is not an Eggman robot, or at least, well, she doesn't know. It's complicated. She in turn asks if they know him, and of course, they do, and she wants to know what they do for him. They say it's nothing special, cook, clean, make coffee. He's very particular about that. Nice and strong, no milk. And Belle finishes with, and lots and lots of sugar. She leans ever closer to a truth that we have all been aware of for quite a while now. And if that wasn't enough, an angry voice comes out of the tablet she has been holding, the same one that she procured from Orbot and Cubot, the voice of Eggman. He's screaming at his two lackey bots, asking how they're screwing up now, as he's aware that the Viper fight isn't going so well. But he's caught off guard by an unfamiliar voice. And as he pulls off his headset, he finally meets Belle. And with a quick eyeful, he sums her up very quickly. Unconventional material, but he'd recognize that joint design anywhere. There's only one person on this planet who builds machines like that me. And suddenly he knows exactly what he's looking at. The little helper that he put together while he was delusional, thinking he was some sort of small town inventor. He takes the time to congratulate himself, saying that even in that impaired state, he was still innovating. He asks the puppet, what did Mr. Tinker call you? To which she responds, Bell the Tinkerer. Bell is clearly shaken by this encounter. But Eggman's got work to do. He tells her not to go anywhere. He's got some questions for her. But first, he has a hedgehog he needs to crush. Bell, heartbroken, heart shattered, but still desperate for some kind of answers. Nervous and terrified as she may be, stumbles over her words, trying her very best to keep Eggman's attention while she has it. She needs some sort of comprehension, some sort of inkling that the man she knew as her father is still here here. She asks him with tears in her eyes, you wouldn't do something like this, not without reason. Please tell me this isn't what it looks like. Eggman ponders for just a moment, saying that, well, since you took care of me while I was in my alter ego, I'll give you a reason, I guess. He says, let me tell you about the tower you find yourself in. For a man of my intellectual caliber, the restraints of reality can, at times, become stifling. Merely tinkering within the limits of our banal world no longer satisfies, and that's where this place comes in. He goes on to say that he has bent the laws of physics themselves to his will. He has made a labyrinth without peer. He goes on to brag about the the labyrinth, his simulation of a world he finds imperfect. He brags about his bad nicks, how quickly they can overrun a town, recruit new test subjects, how they constantly evolve and discover new ways to best dominate whatever environment they find themselves in, adapting and growing with each new generation. And that, I suppose, is his reason. This unrestrained, ever-evolving genius. And he answers her question with 
Another question, what makes your precious toy maker worthy of such admiration in the face of my unrestrained genius? And with that, the tablet collapses on the floor, crashing, ending the communication between the little puppet and her creator. Belle is given only a moment to grieve as the portal behind her reacts. Belle asks the two lackey bots why it's doing that, and long and short of it because Tangle's tail is still caught in that energy field, it's causing something of a feedback loop. It wasn't built to have something in there for that long. Long and short of it, this place is going to implode. So our heroes have got to get out of there. But thankfully, with the arrival of Tangle, our heroes have turned the tides. Eggman, ever being the sore loser, decides to just kamikaze bomb with all three of them. Not unfamiliar from the actual boss fight. But thanks to Tangle, all of them grab hold and make their escape. Bell quickly informs him that, yep, this place is going to blow. We got to get out of here. And Sonic has everybody grab hold of him, including the two robots and they all make their escape on the tornado as the tower consumes itself. And Eggman, who has never been present once during this entire encounter, <laughs> still can't escape a little bit of physical harm as his VR unit overloads on his face. On the tornado, Tails confirms that there is no sign left of the tower. Tangle asks what to do about Orbot and Cubot, who looks so nervous. <laughs> Bell just tells them to let them go. They're not the ones who did this. And Sonic, like he did with Metal Sonic, just agrees. Just yeah, let them loose. So they do just that. Also, what happened with the inking on this page? Everything was so pretty up to this point. What's going on? Look at Tangle's face. Oh, getting flashbacks to early Archie interior art. Oh boy. Now that we have that settled, Tails, as caring as he's been this whole time towards Belle, notices that something's off and asks her if everything's okay. To which she says, without looking at anybody, yes, no, she's fine. Nothing happened. And then with a pause, she says that's not true. Finally deciding to come clean to her new friends about everything going on with her. Things that the reader who has been paying attention this entire series has already figured out the instant we laid eyes on her wooden design and her pink and green uniform. She says that she was built by a man named Mr. Tinker. When he disappeared, people told me he had been a monster all along. That he was actually Dr. Eggman. And she didn't believe him. She couldn't. And she thought that if she could just talk to him, he'd understand and she'd explain and that's the most she can explain before she breaks down into tears. Tingle says that really sucks, but hey, you helped do something good today, and your dad would have been proud of that. And with that bittersweet sentiment, the story comes to a close, with Orbot and Cubot in the ocean. <laughs> okay, so, this is yet again another story that probably didn't need four issues to tell itself, and I don't blame Evan Stanley for this, but you do notice these slower stories after the metal virus, which could be argued that was expanded out much longer than it needed to be, or a lot of IDW in general. Regardless, I am again happy to see some consistency within the writing of these characters. Evan's already proven that she's got a great handle on the other girls in Sonic's cast, so adding Jewel and Tangle into the mix work just as nicely. Tangle still has a little bit of that manic energy, but it's not quite as over the top as we've seen previously. Jewel still has a little bit of growing to do, and we will see that happen, but she's clearly comfortable in her new position, and it is nice to see her role expanded a bit in this new Sonic universe. All that put aside, it's time to talk a little bit about Belle. So, Belle is not exactly the most exciting new character we've seen thus far. She doesn't really have much in the way of cool abilities. I mean, yeah, it's pretty neat that she can read through Eggie's schematics, but she is a bit of a klutz as we quickly found out while trying to help out a straight up hippie. <laughs> <laughs> that, I must admit, is a little confusing. She was built to be a helper. She proved to be very useful at Tails Workshop for the little time we saw of her there. Maybe she was just having an off day in the machine workshop. I don't actually know. But the point of that was to show that she doesn't quite fit in anywhere, and she has been lost for quite a while. And no, the reveal that she was built by Mr. Tinker wasn't exactly a shocker for anybody. One look at her design in that uniform, and you knew exactly who 
did that. That was never going to be a surprise, and the book doesn't treat it like such. We all knew who it was, and deep down, Belle understood that Eggman was Mr. Tinker. Part of her just didn't want to believe it. She didn't want to think that her father, this man that she knew to be this loving, caring person, was capable of such cruelty. I mean, how could she? That was never going to be a shocking plot twist. All it was ever going to be was an emotional gut punch. Revealing who she truly was to Sonic and her friends meant that she also had to come to terms with some hard truths. She wasn't able to confess her whole backstory until she finally confirmed for herself that her father was really and truly gone. Hers is a story of loss, and her journey is going to be one of trying to find yourself and your place in the world after having suffered such a great terrible thing like the death of a parent, long before you're ready to strike out on your own. And at the start of the story, we find that, again, that's not going to be an easy task. And that's why Tangle is such an integral part of this cast. All that matters to the lemur is if you're a good person. That's it. That is exactly what Belle needed, just as that's what Whisper needed. It doesn't matter if you're introverted. It doesn't matter if you're not good at anything specifically. It doesn't matter if you're made of wood. All that matters is what you do with your life and your choices. Like the Rise of Skywalker, just way less messy. Belle wasn't built to be a hero, and in turn, we're probably not going to see anything like a miniseries like we would with Tangle and Whisper, or even Starline. And as such, I don't think she's going to be quite as popular as those characters but all the same. With her, we get to explore some deep, complex, emotional themes. They're a little more fantastical and a little out there, but not so far off that you can't find some real-world parallels. And I know some of you get super upset whenever I point this out, but this is a kid's book at the end of the day. Sure, us adults can't enjoy it, but you should be able to hand this off to a seven-year-old and they should still be able to have a good time. I'm sorry, but the Wild West days of Archie writing is just just long gone at this point, but that doesn't mean you have to treat kids like they're babies. As wild as the concept is of Tinker being the father to a wooden puppet who is sentient and doing its own Pinocchio thing, that's all a bit out there and wild and crazy, but at the same time, a child dealing with the loss of a parent is something, unfortunately, people have to deal with sometimes. A deep, tragic, sudden loss in their lives when they're not ready for for that. And I know fiction is chock full of orphans and all that fun stuff, but I appreciate the heart put into this story and the importance placed on Belle and her identity and having friends around her that don't treat Tinker as Eggman. That is incredibly important. Bad guys turning good and forgetting who they are for a little bit. That's the kind of crap you would see in Saturday morning cartoons and you would throw that away after one episode. And what I like about stories like this is that yes, yeah, sometimes they are dragged out longer than they need to be and yeah we didn't need four issues just to get to this emotional impact for Belle. A lot of this didn't exactly revolve around her but stretching that out and letting that breathe makes it hit that much harder when we have that conversation between Eggman and Belle. And honestly it takes a long time to heal from that kind of pain. So surrounding yourself with people who understand you, who care about you, who love you is probably the most important message to take away from this. Like I said, the Archie days are long behind us and you're probably going to get a much more standardized version of a lot of these game characters. We're not going to meet Sonic's parents. We're not going to get a crazy new bit of lore for his backstory. We're not going to get long lost family members. He's not going to murder somebody and change up the status quo. In other words, we're not going to see a great deal of growth or change in his character or any of these long running game characters. And that's what makes these comic book created characters so important because we can have more complex backstories or arcs. They can have more dynamic relationships. They can change. They can probably die if they need them to die. That's the complicated thing about writing strictly guided IP like Sonic the Hedgehog. These are mascots. These represent a company, a corporation, and said corporation is going to have strict guidelines on how you can use them. That's not made up by writers. That's not some fake BS or whatever 
whatever these idiot content creators want to tell you. That is just how it works. I don't care what they did in the 90s. That is not what they do now. And yes, you can still tell great stories with these characters we've come to know and love. But as you can see with these spread out plot lines, there's really only so much you can do when you have to keep things as tame as they are. So having characters that are allowed to grow and change do help give us some sense of progression in this world. And at the same time, these characters need to make sense and work well with what's already been established for Sonic and the game cast. And I think this crew has a deep love and understanding of this franchise, and I think Bell works great with all of that. Again, not the most exciting character, but we don't need every single character to be an action hero. I really like how unique her design is, I like her personality, I like her story, and I like that she does play a role in carrying on the spirit of Tinker, which as we've discussed before, turned out to be his own person. Sonic and his friends cemented that idea the first time we met him. And yeah, it's great to see Eggman back in full force, but yeah, this is the first time I've seen like a personality shift plotline for a villain leave me missing the other personality. And I'm not alone in that. It was good to see that Belle got some sense of closure, as heartbreaking and traumatic as it was for her. She does finally confirm to herself that yes, her father is gone. But while she has to come to terms with that loss, she finally opens up to these people around her, and I think in turn, they finally, truly see her as an ally and a friend. And yeah, they've been treating her as such for a while, but this finally firmly cements it for all of them. And finally, Belle might have a new home and a new family. But since this is a comic book, the story is far from over. As drawn out as it may be, I am still excited to see what's next for every one of these characters, including the new puppet girl. As for the rest of the story, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's another fun Sonic adventure. I didn't actually mind this one being drawn out as much as it was. I had a lot of fun not only watching Belle and Tangle make their way through the tower, but also watching Amy, Sonic, and Tails make their way through the labyrinth. I wish we had a little bit more time in that creepy, eerie, silent town. It did make it a little bit more eerie when Eggman was hands off, but it was hilarious to watch a toaster yell at Sonic. Seeing them once again take a thing from the games and kind of make sense out of it with the special stages, or at least some kind of reference to Advance 1 special stage, was also kind of cool as well. I mean, the tower was just one giant checkpoint or star post or whatever you want to call it, and it basically acted as a portal to a different dimension. And yeah, there are a lot of fun implications from that, and I don't know if they'll play with that idea again, but I thought that was really cool. I like the design for the new Restoration HQ. It gives me a lot of Ninja Turtle 2 vibes. And yeah, all you haters of the Freedom Fighters and all that fun stuff, say what you want, but if you like Restoration HQ, you like a lot of the ideas that were planted back in the early days of Sonic Sat AM. And this comic just proves to me, even if they aren't using the same faces or names, that those ideas still work well in this franchise. And honestly, it's long overdue for Sonic and all of his crew to have some kind of a home base to be established because the games have been very loosey-goosey about it for a long time. But yeah, once again, I find myself talking way more than I expected to about this storyline. For what this is, I actually had a pretty good time with all these concepts and character exploration for Belle. How much of that makes sense with what we've already known about Tinker, we'll talk about a different time. And I actually appreciate this story a little bit more now that I've given it a second read-through for this video. But that is going to do it for today, guys. I will be back soon soon with some more IDW Sonic and the return of everybody's favorite bad guys, the Deathly Six. <laughs> I know I said we would be doing Archie Sonic soon, but that's been a little bit more complicated than I expected it to be. I uh, want to do it correctly, but I do promise that is coming soon. Thank you all for taking a look at this extra long video. If you're enjoying this channel, be sure you subscribe, like you, you know how that stuff goes. If you got any extra to pitch in and you want to help this grow, then you can do that over on Patreon. You'll get episodes like this early. I just started doing a weekly commentary track for all of my old videos. That's going to be exclusive to patrons. I also got a show in the works that's going to be exclusive just for them. Of course, that's for all of you who have not yet joined in. But for the patrons who are already here, thank you guys so much for all of your help. And you're seeing their lovely names all in front of you right here. These are just the coolest people in the world. I don't know what else to tell you. That's just how it is. And an extra special thank you to all these 
puppet masters who pull on my little marionette strings. Kyle Winter, Cirrus the Skeptic, Joseph Duncan Sonic 2 Blue, John, Josh Strider, Casey the Kinkerer, Faison Razul, Xanderoni the Painter, Trey Nobles, Hatsworth, Nick S, Tristan Trap, Meekers, Dun Dun, Miles the Prower, Jeremy Singer, Mr. Boo J, Rain, Sam Webster, Dwight Graham, Fish Flop, Lucas Lipker, The Bad Pal, Shodan, Mr. SP, Cecil the Glade, The Dark Neon, Missing No, Stefan Plakonica, Three Monic, Graham J. Hall, Lenick, The Game Apologists. <laughs> I get so used to saying these names, I kind of got a flow going, so that caught me off guard. Good job. Carrying on, we also have Wayne is Boss, Lederick, 64 Bits, David 20 Cover Your Eyes, Ryan Rolfs, The Lumberjack, Otis Small, Ya Boy, Shifting Flesh, Mute, Trash Baphomet, and Yes Trash, Having a Favorite Color is a Personality, It's a Sad One, But It's Mine, Autumn from Twitter.com, SSG Infinite Sonic, That Pyra Main, Mui Saxi, <laughs> I still can't see without giggly, and Jin Sayotome. Again, I hope I'm saying that right, I don't know, so Jin, just message me if you need me to correct that. Guys, thank you so much for everything you do for me seriously i still can't get over that this is what i get to do for a living and thank you for letting me live this wonderful dream and hang out with all of you wonderful people this i've been rambling for way too long i gotta get going this is already gonna be way too much to edit so until next time toot toot sonic warriors <laughs> <laughs>